Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael and, and Dauer. Uh, can you see my slides? We can. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And when Dauer reached out to me several months already ago, I was really uh, excited by this opportunity to uh, to actually c communicate with so many people. And uh, this project, congratulations to both of you, is huge success. I think it will be a role model for many scientific societies. So I wanted to be a little bit provocative today, in, as Michael already um, uh, alluded. So I want to, I would like to convince you that uh, Hart actually has not one, but two sinus nodes. And, uh, and of course, I know it will be a lot of skepticism and pushback. I welcome that. So please ask a lot of questions about it. So, uh, and, and welcome from uh, sunny Washington, DC. So this is my building over there. I, I, my office uh, is right there on the fifth floor, and it's just five blocks from the White House where we currently having protests against r racial injustice. And uh, I would like you know, to invite everyone to contribute to this important protest uh, because of uh, police brutality and, and racial injustice, which we witness here in America, unfortunately. Um, so I would like to talk today about sinus knot. And uh, we all use these pictures uh, in our teaching and uh, I'm there to submit that this, both of these pictures are wrong and we have to reevaluate re how we actually explain to students and to ourselves what are the pacemakers of the heart. Picture on the left uh, is from Netter's work, uh, artwork. You can see there, there are green cables uh, between the sinus node and AV node, which I don't believe exist. And yet uh, they actually still uh, on, cover, on the cover page of many journals uh, just received uh, actually heart rhythm today so again, with the same cables, I don't know what to do about it. Uh, so gray is probably closer to truth, but I, as I will show you today, I hopefully, hopefully will convince you that there is another structure which is near inferior vena color, which also has pacemaker properties. Of course, uh, it all started from Sunao Tavares' discovery of the AV node, and then a year later, uh, Keith and Flack uh, discovered what we now know as SA node, uh, which resides right at the orifice of superior vena cava. And then uh, this is less known work by Lydia David, which I strongly recommend to read. Uh, she's the only author and she's one of the first female professors in our field. Uh, she published in 1909, just a couple of years after the discovery of SA note and AV note, the reconstruction in 3D. This is a wax reconstruction of the conduction system of the heart starting from a AV note. You can also see slow and fast pathways there. Uh, it's a really important work. Uh, I also wanted Michael to introduce me, not as a scientist, but as a book collector, which I am. I, I really like books. And the, what you see here, this is my shelf. Unfortunately, it's not on the back, but it's on the side in the office. This is what I bought uh, on an auction in New York City. Uh, this was a library of Myron Prince Metal. Those of you who are medical doctors probably not know about uh, Prince Metal Angina. Uh, so he was a very avid collector. And, uh, and I bought, in particular, this uh, box on the left. Uh, which is actually right here in my hands. It's a uh, basically uh, original reprints by Sir uh, Thomas Lewis and his students describing what is uh, SA note. And here are some pictures from these uh, reprints. Uh, so he used string galvanometer and uh, aligning basically conduction axis uh, demonstrated that the structure which uh, Keith and Flag described just a few years before this paper is in, in, in fact a site of origin of electrical activity in the heart. So that's basically uh, where we are uh, after this work done more than a, a century ago. What we also do know, of course, is that different structures of the heart have different action potentials, which is a reflection of the fact that they have different gene expression, different ion channel portfolio. And I will tell you today how basically sinus node can be identified both functionally, like uh, Sir Thomas Lewis did, uh, although, of course, not with string galvanometer anymore, uh, and also molecularly. We can actually look now at molecular signature of different structures. I was also inspired uh, in my work by this paper published uh, quite a some time ago from Australia, from, I believe from Melbourne, which showed very interesting data in patients with focal uh, atrial tachycardia. Uh, the, all these black dots show here uh, points of origin of such tachycardias in about 130 patients which were ablated and thus proven to be sources of uh, the tachycardia. And you can see that all these black dots reside at the orifices or nearby uh, of major veins. You can see near superior vena cava would be close to sinus node. Also, there is a little uh, black dot near inferior vena cava. 
uh, also, of course, pulmonary veins and coronary sinus. So uh, in our work uh, in my laboratory, we did this work for many, many years. I was really blessed uh, working with some of the pioneers in this field, uh, namely John, John Boyneau, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. He was truly uh, passionate about sinus knot and inspired all of us. So when Alexei Gluchov worked in my lab, uh, so he worked, did this beautiful study showing that if you take a mouse heart and you subject it to sympathetic or parasympathetic stimulation, uh, so, of course, there is a dose response in terms of heart rate. Uh, you, as expected, you have uh, acceleration of heart rate, uh, heart rate uh, with isoproteranol and slowing down with acetylcholine. Importantly, uh, we, he showed that with, uh, uh, if you accelerate it with acetylcholine, I'm sorry, uh, isoproteranol, it, it goes a little bit up, upwards by approximately 1.2 1, 1 millimeter or so. Uh, but in the uh, anchoring knockout, in heterozygous, so this pacemaker is completely disrupted and basically there's no structure, no coherent structure. If you uh, apply uh, acetylcholine, it goes downwards. And what was interesting, we saw occasionally that it actually jumps all the way to inferior vena cava or AV junction, but we didn't pay attention much because at the time our algorithms for detecting site of origin of electrical activity based on optical mechan was not perfect. It required a lot of work by Alexei who spent hours and hours essentially uh, uh, reading every single um, optical potential from uh, 10,000 optical potentials recorded. It was a lot of work. So then uh, with Vadim Fedorov in the lab, we, we started working on human and dog hearts. And following this picture on the left from John Boyno, who did first intraoperative uh, mapping of sinus node activity, he discovered that uh, in panel A, of course, this is what we, we all would expect, that you have to have origin, uh, like Thomas Lewis showed, near superior vena cava, but he showed that actually in some patients, like patient in panel C, it actually originates near inferior vena cava, very far away uh, from actual sinus node, or at least what we think sinus node should be. With Vadim Fedorov, we showed that uh, sinus node, in fact, is buried inside the atrial wall, and it has exit pathways, which connect sinus node to the atrial muscle, and uh, you can manipulate it by electrical stimulation or by uh, autonomic stimulation and, and exit sites can be more superior, more inferior, but still it's in the area approximately of in, uh, superior vena cava. This is how sinus node structure looks like. We never paid attention to the area near inferior uh, vena cava for technical reasons, but also for reasons of basically uh, we didn't know that we have to look there. Therefore, uh, recently I, I, I have uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, now new new Dr. Brennan. She just defended her PhD uh, uh, to a couple of weeks ago, and this is her essentially doctoral work. So we decided to look uh, in the inferior vena cava. And what the first thing she did was uh, she developed a very robust algorithm which allows to automatically detect uh, site of pacemaker on every single heartbeat. Therefore, you can do dynamic mapping uh, when uh, when pacemaker actually dynamically changes its location. So basically, preparation looks like this, as you can see in panel A. It's ex uh, excised rat, uh, right atrium, which contains superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, of course, AV node as well. We do optical mapping with a camera which provides approximately six, 7,000 action potentials. And then using 50% amplitude algorithm, we can detect precisely based on conduction map where the site of pacemaker is located. And you can see here in panel B, location of 10 consecutive heartbeats they all originate in this case in denervated heart closer to inferior vena cava. So uh, when uh, Jacqueline applied uh, different dose, dose of uh, acetylcholine and isoproteranol, so of course she also observed acceleration and deceleration. In panel C, you can see that in vivo heart rate in the rat is approximately 400 beats per minute. Uh, but uh, if you denervate the heart, it goes down to about 300 beats per minute. Uh, but if you apply acetylcholine, it goes down even more to about 200 and in some cases up to 100, down to 100 beats per minute. With isoproteranol, uh, in this case 500 nanomolar, you can see it goes back to essentially what we expect in, in vivo situation or even slightly above with high, high concentrations. So up to 500 beats per minute. Uh, and you can see in panel D in the middle, there is a dose response uh, in terms of heart rate as a concentration of those two drugs. And then um, in panel E, you see uh, Jacqueline reconstructed maps of conduction and star indicates a site of origin of pacemaker. You can see that at baseline, 
uh, with acetacol and it's slightly lower, but still near inferior vena cava. And then with um, isoproteranol, it jumps all the way up to SVC, uh, right at the orifice of SVC, as Sir Thomas Lewis demonstrated in, in a number of species. So in this card, if you plot all the sites of origin, you can see on the right in panel E that there are def definitely two clusters. There is one cluster near superior vena cava shown in red dots, and another cluster, black and blue dots, which correspond to baseline and acetacol, and they re reside near inferior vena cava. And there is nothing in between, really. Uh, and then I told, okay, Jacqueline, let's take a look. Let's plot all the all the dots we have for all the hearts. We studied eight hearts, which she did. Uh, to do uh, normalization of this data, we basically normalize from zero to one between inferior vena cava and superior vena cava, because there is slight variance from heart to heart. And you can see in panel D, a cluster or constellation of red dots and blue dots and black dots, which show clearly that there is a, uh, essentially congregation of sites of origin near superior vena cava in red dots and another one near inferior vena cava with blue dots and really nothing in between. And the cluster analysis, well, I'll talk about it a little bit later, uh, quantitatively demonstrated on the right, you can see there are two bumps uh, which clearly show statistically significant uh, different uh, clusters near superior and inferior vena cava. And if you superimpose all this data on um, reconstruction of the heart shape in panel F, you can see that these clusters clearly show there's a superior sinus node and inferior sinus node, which I submit we, uh, I know it's very controversial, we'll talk about it, if we can call it that. So to show uh, reproducibility, um, this is all eight hearts which uh, Jacqueline studied, and you can clearly see in every single heart there is a clusterization with slight variance how far it goes to superior vena cava or inferior vena cava. So this is cluster analysis. Uh, I only show part of it. Her dissertation and paper actually include much more. So if you normalize uh, distance between superior and inferior vena cava, which is y-axis over all concentrations, uh, of uh, um, acetacol and, and isoproteranol, of a different heart rate, of a different, uh, for only highest concentrations, you see the blue curves show clearly there are two, uh, two clusters. And they, the, it's not just gradient between this superior and inferior vena cava, it's really two clusters. And the uh, ROC curves show clearly uh, that this is highly significant in terms of statistics. So next question, I said, okay, this is great, but uh, maybe it's still it's a gradient. Let's try to separate those sinus nodes. And uh, uh, which Jacqueline did, she cut between superior and inferior sinus node. Uh, and uh, uh, basically first she recorded an intact preparation. Again, as I showed before, in intact baseline, you have 300 beats per minute. After you separate the two, two sinus nodes, you have uh, independent activity. And you can see here at baseline, there is a great variance in the superior sinus node, less variance in the inferior sinus node. Interestingly, when you apply a highest concentration of, iso, uh, of uh, um, acetylcholine, superior sinus node in majority of preparations in, in four out of five is completely silenced. Basically, it becomes quiescent. And this is probably what explains why a vagal stimulation moves pacemaker from uh, superior sinus node to inferior sinus node. And also you observe uh, inversion of P wave. Uh, well, if you wash out acetylcholine and put uh, 500 nanomolar iso isoproteranol, uh, both pacemakers now function, and the superior sinus node tends to be faster. And that's why, again, during sympathetic stimulation, superior sinus node dominates. And that's what we see generally because we do have sympathetic tone during normal physiological uh, function. So these are, again, uh, all uh, preparations. Uh, all five preparations which are separated. So you can see on top uh, panel, this is baseline. So you can see that in uh, second heart, uh, you have a leading pacemaker near superior sinus node, uh, but actually the other ones tend to be near inferior uh, area. And then when you cut it down, you can see again uh, that you have two pacemakers and basically what I showed you as a representative example uh, is reproduced in all five studied hearts. So after that, we decided to look at gene expression. And basically, um, uh, so Jacqueline uh, removed tissue from independent hearts, not, uh, not operated on uh, and not mapped, because I was worried that long uh, experiment with uh, crystalloid perfusion will affect gene expression. Uh, so she separated tissue from what we now call superior sinus node, shown in pink. Uh, blue is inferior sinus node. Green is right atrial tissue. 
and gray is left atrial tissue. We also have ventricular tissues, but uh, for this paper, I just don't show it, but it's all published already uh, online. What you clearly see is uh, in panel D, uh, without a, even doing statistical analysis, that superior sinus node, which is left column, and inferior sinus node, which is next to it, have very different signature of gene expression as compared to right atrium and left atrium. Uh, and uh, if you look more carefully in panel E, uh, we, we, we showed upregulated differentially expressed genes uh, in uh, superior sinus node, inferior sinus node, or both nodes versus right atrium. And we only selected here genes which are uh, participants in electrical activity. And you can see clearly that a number of potassium channels are differentially expressed uh, in both nodes, calcium channels, sodium channels, of course, uh, and uh, some of them are unique for one ver versus another node, but many, many genes are, are common. So basically, the two nodes share gene expression profile with one another, and which is different from signature or tra transcriptome of uh, uh, right atrial tissue. Uh, in a Go analysis, uh, shows also that uh, there is a big difference in metabolism uh, between nodal tissue and uh, atrial tissue, which we, of course, know that uh, nodal cells are less mature and they have essentially underdeveloped met metabolic uh, portfolio of genes. Uh, in panel F, we looked at specific genes of interest, and some of them you can predict. For example, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but I will read it for you. HCN4, for example. HCN4 gene uh, predictably has high expression at the superior sinus node, then a little bit less at inferior sinus node, and then, of course, much, much less at, at both right and left atrium. So similarly, you can look at PTEX2, another important gene which regulates uh, conduct expression in the, in the node, and AV node and sinus node. Also, it's quite uh, interestingly expressed there. There is SHOX2 differences as well. You can see very high expression in both nodes as compared to right atrial tissue. And then uh, the same is found about TBX3. Uh, disappointingly, uh, TBX18, which was presented as uh, SA node gene, uh, we did not see, we could not confirm that in this particular uh, set of data. So this is a more uh, um, zoomed in picture. You can see here your favorite uh, potassium calcium channels, basically ryanidine receptor. Uh, all the top genes show clear difference. Again, two left columns show uh, a superior inferior sinus, not two right columns show right atrium, left atrium. There's a big difference in expression. So again, there's a gradient, uh, superior sinus node is more blue as compared to inferior sinus node, but they're still blue as compared to uh, both uh, atrial tissues. So uh, again, if you look at the whole portfolio I showed in the previous picture, only some of them, uh, I, I will invite you to review these genes and find your favorite. Uh, again, paper is already on by archives, so you can download it. So, the next question was, uh, is it really relevant? Uh, this, uh, is it also has something to do with humans? And of course, uh, humans, exper experiments with humans are very, very difficult. So uh, when we worked with human hearts back at Washington University in St. Louis with Vadim Fedorov, with Alexei Gluchov and others, we were unable to uh, actually isolate sinus node in, from human heart because of very complex anatomy. Uh, so human heart, unlike rat, of course, cannot be superfused. Uh, it has to be coronary perfused. Uh, and importantly, human heart has uh, at least three major variants of uh, sinoatrial no nodal artery, which is very difficult to know a priori. So one of them comes essentially from right coronary artery and goes upwards along the septum, interatrial septum, and wraps around superior vena cava. Uh, this is the dominant variant, and this is the easy one, easy to, to deal with because you can just cannulate essentially right coronary artery. But the other two, unfortunately, originate in the left atrium. One comes through Bachmann bundle, and the other one even goes through the back of the heart, through the uh, pulmonary, uh, I'm sorry, uh, pulmonary veins uh, or pulmonary trunk. And then it goes again wrapping around sinus node. So I, to isolate those two is impossible, essentially, in laboratory settings. And uh, uh, we managed only uh, to, to have essentially uh, three hearts uh, mapped like uh, with optical mapping and isolated heart from, from the endocardium. Our previous work was done with Vadim Fedorov from the epicardium because we had to use intact hearts. So we, basically we had uh, intact human heart cannulated with uh, right and left coronary artery dual cannulation. We would remove ventricles and uh, uh, close all the, all the branches, ventricular branches, but the atria will be intact. 
Uh, and this unfortunately prevented us from seeing uh, activity near uh, inferior sinus node. But in order to see it, you really have to look at the endocardium. And that's what basically Jacqueline uh, succeeded in doing. So in these hearts, what we found was uh, in denervated human hearts, you have a heart rate of approximately 70 beats per minute. Uh, and then when you uh, apply acetylcholine, it goes a little bit down to about 60 beats per minute. And then you apply isopraternal, of course, it goes up. And uh, it, between, essentially, it's around 100 beats per minute on average. Uh, but uh, you can see that there is some variance between 70 and 120 in these three hearts. Again, uh, when you look at panel C, uh, these are activation maps. So you can see that uh, in baseline, it's actually somewhere in the middle uh, and then closer still to IVC. When you apply acetylcholine, it, it tends to go down and essentially closer to IVC even more. But with, uh, with isopraternal, uh, it actually goes up to superior vena cava. And then again, we did the same cluster analysis. You can see clearly in panel D that there is one cluster near superior vena cava, another cluster near inferior vena cava, and there is very little in between. In our previous work, uh, we focused only on the superior sinus node and basically identified that the superior sinus node does have multiple exit pathways. But like I said, we couldn't pay attention to the inferior sinus node because it was not visible as well on the in the intact heart. And then, uh, so following this functional characterization, again, Jacqueline uh, took another separate uh, uh, five hearts and uh, isolated sinus node tissue versus uh, other tissues and did uh, also RNA sequencing and looked at gene expression profile. And here is the data. So again, uh, interestingly, if you look at panel E, so these are upregulated differentially expressed genes and downregulated differentially expressed genes. So you can see that uh, both superior and inferior sinus node have uh, 534 uh, genes which are upregulated versus right atrium and 347 genes which are downregulated versus uh, right atrium. And you can see in panel G, they really share uh, this uh, general signature uh, and difference with right and left atria. But also in importantly, uh, superior sinus node has more genes which are uniquely up or down regulated versus right atrium. And the uh, inferior sinus node has also uh, a number of genes which are differentially expressed, which are different from superior sinus node. And uh, then we looked at, in panel F, essentially most uh, significantly uh, different genes as shown here up or down regulated in uh, 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 right, uh, in red or blue dots. And again, uh, in panel H, you can look at some of these genes. So for example, again, you know, HCN4 has generally the same trend as I showed you in red. Again, the uh, Superior and inferior sinus node has high expression. Uh, right atrium is close, but still below, and uh, left atrium is much, much uh, lower expression. So you have also differences in, of course, gap junctions. You have differences in uh, a number of pot uh, calcium channels, number of potassium channels. Uh, TBX3 has, again, the same uh, tendency. So you can see that TBX3 is high expressed in uh, uh, both nodes, uh, and which actually, by the way, they express at the same level versus both atria. And TBX18 also is highly expressed in the uh, superior sinus node as compared to inferior, and then down uh, to both atria. So uh, again, looking at the uh, differentially expressed genes, uh, you can see that there is actually 10,000 genes which are common between superior and inferior sinus nodes as well as atria. So that, these are atrial tissues, of course. But as I showed before, there's also a big difference uh, in these nodal structures versus uh, right atrial tissue and, or left atrial tissue. Also, as you can see in panel F, uh, differentially expressed genes uh, uh, approximately the same level between uh, superior and inferior sinus node versus uh, right atrium, even, even though they are not statistically different, but inferior node has slightly lesser number of genes. And now if you look at uh, differentially expressed genes in the superior node and inferior node versus right atrium in panel G, again, you can see KCN uh, E4, uh, KCN N3, uh, a number of other potassium channels are among those which are differentially expressed. Uh, uh, cardiac receptors, you can see here, adrenergic receptors are differentially expressed. Uh, some of the neural proteins also differentially expressed. And this reflects the fact that of course, uh, unfortunately, we, we did not do yet uh, single cell RNA sequencing. These are uh, full, full tissue uh, uh, samples, including neurons. And we know that atrial tissue in the human actually has higher density of neurons as compared to 
uh, right atrial tissue. And then, of course, also, as I showed before, developmental uh, transcription factors, including BMP2, uh, shocks to uh, also differentially expressed. So this is, again, a more uh, systematic uh, representation. And this time, we included also right and left ventricles. And you can clearly see that uh, the superior sinus node and inferior sinus node, which are left columns, are different from right atrium and left atrium, and, and from ventricles, of course, as well. But there is, of course, also a difference between atria and ventricles, which is quite, dram quite dramatic, especially uh, in the, uh, in the, in, on the top with uh, calcium, potassium channels, sodium channels, ryanodine receptors. So basically, clearly, this molecular representation shows that Superior and inferior sinus nodes share uh, gene expression portfolio with each other, even though there are some differences, but they're also very different from both the atria and the ventricles. Uh, now, very briefly, uh, uh, I will also, our initial, initial goal was actually to look what happens in heart failure with, with sinus node. And we chose a model which was developed in the laboratory of, of uh, David Mendelowitz here at George Washington University, which is a very aggressive um, uh, transverse aortic constriction in, uh, at the very early stage uh, uh, in PUPS at uh, FH age of belief of one week. And then as uh, rats grow, they do all develop severe heart failure, as you can see here, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and basically, we looked at sinus node. Uh, disappointingly to us, we found that in this model, there is no sick sinus syndrome. A sinus actually is doing all right. So it, it responds so has the same, as you can see in panel B, uh, has the same uh, sinus node recovery time. Also in panel D, you can see it doesn't change between normal and failing hearts de depending on the heart rate. Uh, and also it, there is no difference basically between failing and non-failing hearts in rate. It's still the same 400 beats per minute in, 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 in vivo. Uh, it, when you denervate, it goes to about 250 with acetylcholine drops down to 150 or so slightly lower maybe with versus normal, but not much. And then with isoproteranol, it goes back up to about 400. Uh, this was disappointing, but then we looked at the data and found something peculiar. Uh, we found that out of all the studied hearts, we could not find the heart in which uh, heart, the same heart would have two pacemakers. There is always one pacemaker only. But interestingly, in panel B, you see top data from one of the hearts you can see, regardless if you baseline acetylcholine or isoproteranol, it's always near superior vena cava. And you can see uh, on the right, cluster is always there. But in another rat, uh, it's always near inferior vena cava. And you can do, so we separated four rats, only had superior vena cava pacemaker, so traditional SA node, and two other rats only had inferior vena cava, but none of the rats had both. And to show reproducibility, here is all studied six hearts uh, with heart failure. You can clearly see, you know, the top uh, pacemaker, superior sinus node in four rats, and then the bottom inferior pacemaker in the remaining uh, rats, number five and number six. So therefore, let me conclude. So we have plenty of time, for, hopefully, for discussion. So basically, I think I convinced you, hopefully, that both rat and human hearts have two sinoatrial nodes. Uh, superior sinus node and inferior sinus node. And they, we showed it both functionally as well as molecularly in terms of gene expression. We also found that superior sinus node controls heart, high heart rate, so essentially normal physiological rate, but also during a fight and flight response. Inferior sinus node only controls slow heart rates. Uh, and actually, we looked at some pediatric recordings and found, yes, indeed, in children, inversion of P wave is quite common, especially at early age, which probably reflects this particular finding. We also found, uh, surprisingly to us, that failing heart, even though in this particular heart uh, failure model, uh, there is no heart rate differences between normal hearts and failing hearts, but there is big difference in terms of lack of two, two pacemakers. There's always only one pacemaker, and it's only superior or only inferior. And uh, uh, Basically, I think we, uh, this data really opens up new opportunities. And I believe that based on this nice paper from Melbourne and also findings, of course, of many other groups, we occasionally saw pacemaker uh, cells, pacemaker tissues in many different areas of the heart. But uh, we believe that future hypothesis will be that all orifices of great veins, all boundary tissue between myocardium and, and the tissue of veins such as SVC, IVC, uh, coronary sinus, pulmonary veins, as, as well as AV group, they all harbor pacemaker regions. 
uh, in the heart, which play a role uh, sometimes in normal physiology, but more importantly in pathophysiology, when you have remodeling due to heart failure, due to atrial fibrillation, and these pacemakers will essentially start dominating and producing arrhythmic events uh, such as atrial tachycardia and atrial fibrillation. And I would like to give credit to uh, funding to uh, our Washington Regional Transplant Community. This is essentially organ procurement organization which uh, provides us with hearts of donors which are not accepted for transplantation. Also support by National Institutes of Health, LaDuke Foundation, American Heart Association for their generous support. And of course, Jacqueline Brennan uh, is a sole hero of this particular uh, work. I, I give her the entire credit for this work. Thank you. And I'll be happy to ask and answer any questions you might have. Igor, I've got a, about a million questions. I had to uh, call my son to provide me with more sheets of paper to write down all, <laughs> all my questions. But I, I, I'm not going to uh, dominate the question session. We have a few in the Q and A's. But I will start with one, you, one question, if I may which is, well, <laughs> I may be cheeky and go for two. Uh, my first question is, if you just look ultrastructurally uh, at the atria, can you see, uh, we're used to identifying the landmarks of where we find the superior SA node. The inferior SA node, if you look at the ultrastructural detail, do these look like sinus nodal cells in such that they've got very few myofilaments, lots of cavioli, uh, lots of membrane, the sort of spider cells the, that we've heard described before for the SA node. Is there anatomically a discrete bunch of cells that you can see near the inferior vena cava that look microscopically similar to the, the superior SA node? Can you see these ultrastructurally? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have histology in my presentation here. Uh, we, we haven't done histology in this particular uh, paper, but we did it before. And uh, uh, it's, we published plenty of histology with Vadim Fedorov, with Alexei Glukov. So basically, uh, sinus node in the human heart, for example, uh, if you just do Mason trichrome, it looks very blue. It's, it's extremely fibrotic. Uh, so yeah. it, looks, it has a lot of uh, um, uh, collagen, a lot of uh, fibroblasts. And uh, I think this is the key uh, issue uh, why sinus node cells remain in, in this immature pacemaker phenotype. So I would dare to, to speculate, uh, taken essentially parallel from skin biology. My wife is a skin biologist, so she teaches me that. But basically, the point is that uh, nucleus in, in cells, skin or heart, is subjected to mechanical uh, forces, mechanical uh, stretching. And uh, it's done through essentially nuclear receptors, a couple through actin fibers, to uh, focal adhesion kinase and receptors on the membrane, and then in turn, those are coupled to extracellular matrix. Uh, and basically, when you have mechanical uh, force applied to the cell, it, tr it is transduced directly to the nucleus. So in skin biology, it means that when cell starts proliferating from the basal level uh, of uh, uh, essentially what we can call uh, um, stem cells, it is pulled uh, by mechanical forces, and as a result, uh, chromatin landscape will change. It was demonstrated in skin biology. So different portfolio of genes will be expressed, and cell is transformed from uh, this primitive, uh, um, essentially, stem cell phenotype into keratinocyte. And then it, as it moves up upwards, it, it is again subjected to different forces. Ultimately, it will become cornified envelope with loose nucleus, etc. But basically, this transformation is driven by uh, mechanical forces. So I, I would dare to suggest that SA node uh, remains this, in this primitive state because it is protected by uh, essentially much more fibrous environment. Uh, I saw a recent paper, I, I apologize, I forgot uh, who presented it. Uh, it was a, at the American Heart Association showing that if you denervate, I'm sorry, if you decellularize a tissue from a swine SA node uh, and look at just extracellular matrix uh, from sinus node versus the uh, atrial uh, working myocardium, stiffness, mechanical stiffness, passive stiffness, so this extracellular matrix in the sinus node is 10, 10 times higher as compared to working myocardium, which means essentially that SA node is protected uh, from uh, from those uh, pulsatile stretches which every other cell experiences. 
And therefore, uh, there is probably different um, uh, chromatin landscape. We need to do this work. We haven't done it yet, but that's what we are planning to do. I, I guess we uh, we could talk about this for hours, actually. But I mean, yeah. I guess that the mechanical <laughs> stresses of the dilating atria in heart failure and the, the trigger for atrial fibrillation really maps onto what you're saying there. So exactly. we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's let's cut to the chase and go to some questions from the audience. The, fir the first question for you, Igor, from Emma Robinson mm -hmm. is, to what extent are the ion channels that you focused on in the expression data specific to cardiomyocytes? The use of bulk tissue could have confounded the findings in differential remodeling of the different regions. A few candidates expected were not there. Did you do any validation, maybe qPCR in isolated cells? Uh, no, we have not done it yet. Um, so interesting part is that uh, in um, uh, rabbit sinus node, for example, uh, there, there is a very well-developed marker, which uh, was identified by a number of investigators. I learned it from Mark Bayet uh, and from Manchester Group, which is basically a neurofilament. So neurofilament, is, which is obviously a neuronal protein, is expressed in sinus node cells and AV node cells in, in the uh, Purkinje network. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, ion channels, uh, some of the potassium channels, some of the calcium channels, which are actually uh, also common with, uh, with neurons, are expressed as well in the sinus node cells and a a AV node cells, and are not expressed in the working myocardium. So we believe that some of the neuronal uh, proteins, not only uh, electrophysiology related, but also me metabolism related, signaling related, which are neuronal, but they are expressed in, in these uh, nodal cells, in the primitive myocardium cells. And it is not because these cells are derived from uh, neural crest, as was shown by Rob Gordy many years ago. They are really myocytes, but somehow they would, re re uh, essentially the transcriptome of neurons will re-emerge uh, at some stage of development. And again, I believe it's because of this uh, uh, basically chromatin landscape changes, differences between working myocardium and uh, uh, particular, uh, uh, particular cell type uh, in the sinus node. So we have not done isolated cells yet. Uh, we plan to do it. We have one paper published with um, uh, Ed Lakata uh, on calcium clock in cells isolated from human sinus node. And we plan to, to continue this work. But at this point, uh, basically, we have not focused yet on uh, specific targets because there are so many of them and I would like to actually open it up to, to those who are interested or those who are experts in specific channels. And I Eagle, maybe we can, um, I'll, I'll skip a couple of questions, we'll come back to them because uh, you've just touched on something that David Eisner asked about. So David has asked, any ideas as to whether the dependency of pacemaking on the calcium clock as opposed to the membrane clock is different in your two sinus nodes? Well, you've just, you just mentioned your work with Ed Lacasa, mm -hmm. so maybe you'd like to just answer David's question whilst we're on the subject. Yeah. Hi, David. Glad to hear from you. Uh, yes, actually, I was also thinking about that, uh, um, you know, when we looked at the data. But you, you can see yourself, and please, I invite you to download from BioArchives as well. You can uh, use magnifying glass. But you can see, basically, <laughs> ryanogen receptors do have differences in expression. Calcium channels do have differences in expression. So in this picture, you can see it for basically CAV 1.2, CAV 3.2, uh, uh, all have slight gradient there. Uh, and um, also HCN4 has different. So basically there is an indication that both voltage and calcium clocks are different in two, in two different nodes. And that's, I believe, why we have differences in uh, baseline rate of these two pacemakers, but also in how they actually respond to sympathetic or parasympathetic stimulation. So it seems that superior sinus node is uh, essentially easily, readily inhibited by uh, vagal stimulation, completely to complete silence, while inferior sinus node remains active. This could be due to essentially differences in the, uh, one of the, these two clocks. Excellent, Igor. Uh, whilst you're on that subject, do you, is there regional difference in autonomic innovation that, that you can see uh, histologically in terms of where the vagal nerve terminals are, where the sympathetic nerve terminals are? Are you seeing clusters of uh, autonomic innovation in the inferior region? So um, about 10 years ago, we published paper with uh, Vadim Fedorov and uh, uh, Bill Hacker. Who is, Vadim is now at Ohio State and Bill is at Harvard Medical School, in which we actually looked at expression of um, sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves using 
tyrosine hydroxylase and kalin acetyl transferase markers and fl fluorescent uh, imaging. And we did find, uh, if I remember, about, uh, there is about a four to six fold difference in density of innervation between sinus node versus uh, actual uh, atrial tissue nearby. And we did look a little bit downwards, not only near superior vena cava, but downwards where it seems that uh, um, innervation is somewhat less dense as compared to uh, superior sinus node. And also, I don't have data with me. We have a beautiful project going on with uh, uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar from UCLA and his collaborators on the SPARC program. It's a big autonomic uh, innervation program here at NIH. And we will present very soon detailed maps uh, of innervation of the uh, various species, mammalian species, including mouse and human and pig, I believe. And wow. yes, there are regional differences in these two regions. Uh, it's very exciting, Igor. We're going to have to change all the textbooks, uh, everything. So uh, we have 24 questions. So uh, my advice to you, and if you want to be uh, not here for the next few hours, is uh, try and try and uh, let's see if we can get through some of these uh, fairly quickly. Tamar Mohammed uh, says, "Great talk as usual. Uh, do you think the extra sinus nose in the rats is to enable the heart to beat five times faster than the human heart?" I think you sort of answered this in your talk, but anyway, um, it is interesting to correlate the presence of extra sinus nose with the number of beats of the. Mm, I don't know. I think you may have answered this, but uh, is the differences between different species? and whether they relate to high heart rate versus low heart rate in the different species, I think he's asking. But I think you Actually, we do have answer on that one. Uh, Jacqueline, also in her doctoral work, uh, did uh, mapping, optical mapping of sinus node on epicardium and endocardium in five different species, including mouse, rat, rabbit, uh, pig, and human. And we do see differences in, across species. For example, pig tends to be more inferior, uh, while mm -hmm. other species tend to be more superior. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, Richard Head says, stunning talk, brilliant, thank you. So, thank you, Richard. Uh, Robert, Robert Rose says, hi, Igor, very interesting data. Two questions. Do you know if there's a differential amount of fibrosis in the middle region uh, that doesn't seem to show in initial activation sites? Might this affect the ability of the middle region to display an initial activation? And do lower doses of ISO or ACH ever lead to shifts into the middle region between the two main clusters. You, like, do you ever see anything in the middle region or what's protecting the middle region from being spontaneous, I guess is a question. Yeah, well, second part of the question I answered, we, had, we did yeah. a concentration uh, range and basically we do not see in the middle, no. uh, in the middle concentrations. However, uh, first part of the question, unfortunately, I cannot answer. We have not yet done detailed um, anatomical mapping of fibrosis, but we plan to do it. And uh, the best way to do it would be actually to, to decellularize tissue and, and in, in, uh, interrogate mechanical stiffness across this whole axis between superior and inferior vena cava. And of course, we'll do histology as well. Excellent. I mean, this, this so you. Uh, you've you've on, skipped one of the questions. There's I Dan Johnson's one. question. Dan Johnson, no? Yes. Which one? Yes, yeah, it was between Tamar Mohammed and uh, David. Oh yeah, Eisen. Dan Johnson. So yeah, sorry, Dan. Uh, beautiful data, thank you. Following on from Emma's question, I, I noticed you didn't detect any SCN5A in the rat data, which is quite surprising. I thought I saw it there, but anyway. Do you think the, this is due to the technique used for RNA-seq? Also, and perhaps with a little provocative, have you looked at ROS generation and the different SA nodes ex vivo? Do you think hypoxia could play a role? Uh, is, your, is, your, is your tissue damaged? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, it's always, always the question. <laughs> uh, it was definitely damaged when we cut, cut in the middle. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe that's why we couldn't do it in the human, for example, because there is a ganglionating plexus right, located right b between the two sinus nodes on the epicardium. When you actually cut it through, you, you, you damage nerve, uh, uh, cardiac nerves, which innervate obviously very, very heavily both superior and inferior vena cava. Uh, but in the intact preparation, uh, we are pretty far away from um, uh, cut areas. So, 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 so inferior vena cava and superior vena cava are really far. It's, we have ent all, entire uh, right atrium, and we are mapping essentially at a great distance from the for cut regions. And I believe that we've done th this work for quite a few years now, and I learned it from Mark Boyet and others who did it even more. Uh, for many, many more years. And uh, I, I still uh, dare to, to, to submit that probably the damage did not play a major role here. 
Okay. And so, SCN yeah. Prime A in the rat? What, what uh, was I think it, there was some, yes. But I again, think I, I thought yeah, I yeah, it was the, there. The, the, but again, this is not single cell RNA sequencing. Of course, we still, yeah. even though if you focus on sinus node, we still have nearby transitional yeah. cells and some probably even atrial cells. So you will find some of the markers as well of atrial yeah, cells. Cool. So Mike, do you mind if I just quickly jump in here no, no with, just, with just a comment, really, uh, not a question. So it, uh, we, about probably about a year and a half ago now, together with Ming Lei from Oxford, uh, we, we also looked at some optically mapped sinoatrial preparations, and we found actually a change in the sites of the pacemaker in, you know, in different hearts. But we thought it was because we were bad. <laughs> we, were, <laughs> we, were, we were not very good at it. So, so you really prompted me now to go back to those traces. Um, and actually, well, I, I, Dower, I, I see that Thomas Eschenhagen just also asked a similar question. He also said he saw in did 2012, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, the, the, yeah. smart, the smart people out there spot what's interesting, you see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clearly I wasn't smart. I'm not an architect. <laughs> Heinrich Tagmeier asks, uh, in which one of the two sinus nodes is the sinus nodal artery in the center? Uh, presumably. Uh, in the superior, superior. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's a, a, well, again, in the center, uh, in the dog. <laughs> in the human, it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah, you know, you in the dog, it's very easy. Uh, we studied probably in my life about 40 dog hearts, uh, sinus node mapping. Uh, in, the, in, in 39 of them, it was always the same exact story, like what uh, Thomas Lewis showed. If you look at Thomas Lewis's picture, uh, he beautifully depicted his experiment. He was a great artist, not only scientist. Let me see if I can show it to you. Uh, <laughs> you, you can share again if you like, because I've stopped share sharing. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I'll share. Basically, there is a, uh, well, actually this picture is not maybe very good, but anyway, so it's a, essentially it's a bifurcation. So it comes uh, from about mid, mid distance from uh, right coronary artery or orifice on the uh, anterior epicardium goes up and then bifurcates and sinus node sits kind of in the middle here. Uh, but in human, it comes through the sinus node. But again, as I said, because there are three different variants, actually there are more than three, but uh, three major variants. And it's quite a, quite a big difference how it actually spins through sinus node, but still it goes approximately through the center of superior sinus node. In the inferior sinus node, we did not look at yet at morphology of, of uh, uh, a coronary artery there, or, or arteries there, but of course we need to do that. Okay, Chris O'Shea has got a, a technical question. Uh, sure. He apologizes for asking a rather boring technical question, but he says, I noticed you use 50% depolarization as your activation time. Were you able to see the same effects when looking at DF by DT max? Also, is there an effect on the overall conduction velocity depending on whether conduction starts in one node versus mm -hmm. the other? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. In fact, it's always the major question if you talk to people who study sinus node. <laughs> because t technically, as you, as you all know, we t typically if you look at uh, cells with high uh, expression of sodium channels and fast upstroke, you always do DVDT max. That's given. But in sinus node, because it is much slower action potential, uh, it doesn't really work uh, quite often. And, uh, and the, basically, well, we can argue if it's valid or not, but... Uh, it's been already quite common tradition to use uh, action potential 50% of the amp. It goes back to 1960s to microelectrode recordings done in uh, Amsterdam and in the UK. And we followed the same uh, protocol, basically. Okay. Delphine Mika says, impressive. Thanks a lot. So thank you, Delphine. Uh, David Wolfson says, what age were your rodents that you used for the RNA-seq data? I asked because TBX18 is an embryonic transcription factor. Okay. It's more highly expressed in the SA node from embryonic to neonatal stage, but not so much in the adult. So well, that, the that, age of... I feel better now. <laughs> 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 yeah, actually, these rats, this, we used essentially heart failure rats and normal rats of the same approximately age. So they were basically between like 12 and 16 weeks. So which okay. is, they are not embryonic. <laughs> They're definitely not embryonic. Okay. Right. Uh, Motohira Motede asks, says, great talk, Igor. Uh, your nice work shows clear difference between the superior SA node and the inferior SA node. We know that there is a chance that the initial exit site can also be in the middle of the S superior and inferior nodes. How is that explained by the existence of the two sinus node theory? So the exit site. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, in the, in the rat, uh, there are no exit sites. 
And rat essentially is a, it's a two dimensional structure. Uh, it's clearly different structures. Basically, in the rat superior say not and rat inferior say not, there is slight variability. Uh, pacemaker can actually shift within within superior sinus node or within inferior sinus node. But in the human, yes, a human heart, of course, has uh, exit sites. And again, like I said before, we, uh, with Vadim, Vadim's work, we focused on superior sinus not only for technical reasons because we couldn't see inferior, but we, but still, if you look at re beautiful uh, reconstructions, which Vadim did already after he moved to his own lab at Ohio State uh, and already became full professor, uh, so he did beautiful reconstructions, but all these structures are very close to superior sinus node, not inferior sinus node. Again, yeah. for the reasons I just mentioned, because it's really difficult to map from epicardium inferior sinus node. Thomas Eschenhagen uh, says, great data and talk. Uh, it's really exciting. Uh, I think it's more or less the question I asked at the start, which is, do you have structural histological data supporting the existence of the inferior sinus node? Um, I think we sort of covered that mostly at the start, yeah? Right, so, right. I mean, I, we haven't done detailed uh, electron microscopy yet, uh, but we plan to do that, yes. Yeah, sure. That, that's great. David Wilson, could some of these observations of two pacemaker sites be explained by the known head and tail regions of the sinus node, i.e. are they connected? <laughs> right, yeah, no, no, I, I mean, it's a legitimate question. I, I actually, yeah. I, you know, I talked to Vincent Christoffels, he asked the same exact question <laughs> and others. Yeah, yeah uh, but basically it could perhaps, uh, based on, uh, on uh, mapping with immunofluorescence and different markers, but again, what we do see functionally uh, there is no middle uh, there. The middle essentially is not active really as a, pa as a pacemaker. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, even though if you look at, for example, neurofilament staining done by Halina Dabrinsky and uh, Mark Boyet years, years and years ago at uh, Manchester, they showed that this whole intercaval region between superior and inferior uh, uh, region does uh, have a kind of gradient of expression of this potent marker neurofilament. Uh, mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, Essentially, functional data indicates these are different structures. That's what I would submit right now. But we need no, to do more. No green wires like you showed in the early... No, no green uh, wires. <laughs> no green wires. <laughs> okay, Delphine Micker uh, says, do you think superior and inferior sinus nodes are composed of only sinus nodal cells, or are we talking a mixed population of cells and atrial cells? Well, I, I think we know the answer to that for the superior. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a mix, it's a, and we still, yeah. we need really to do anatomically, um, anatomical mapping of single cell uh, RNA sequencing uh, in order to answer this question more definitively. I, re I remember Dennis Noble's modeling where you needed to get the coupling between the islands of sinus nodal cells and, and atrial cells to make the whole structure work as a, as a unit. Yeah. So exactly. I, I would imagine something might be true mm -hmm. in the inferior site as well. An anonymous attendee, uh, attendee says, great results, thank you for the talk. A few questions. A, can you see any electrical connection path? We just talked about this between both pacemakers. Um, and have you a chance to check pacemaker pattern changes with aging? So the, I, I think the aging is the interesting question there. So, Well, I think aging actually is the most, most interesting question for, to me. We don't have yet uh, uh, data, but what I do, what I do know, I, I came across a data set from uh, Russia, a pediatric study, which was a halter monitoring in 200 healthy children. Uh, and it was 24 hours uh, monitoring. And what is interesting, what we found in this data is that younger the child, more likelihood there is a P wave inversion uh, in, during, uh, during nighttime when the child goes to sleep <laughs> versus daytime. And daytime, we all have upright P wave, but in nighttime, it actually flips uh, down. And as, as children age, uh, this, this pattern actually slowly disappears. Perhaps in uh, adults, uh, it's less, less uh, evident, and especially during aging. So, but again, well, it's just a speculation at this point. I, I think the other interesting of course, question, and Alicia may talk to us a little bit about this in next week, but uh, you know, athletic training, for example. Yes, exactly. I also saw uh, this announcement. I would, I'd like to see it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Whether there's because, a shift you know, We actually do know. I, uh, I teach physiology for many years, and uh, one of my courses, I, uh, my students have to take ECG. And then they, some of them run to me with eyes like that, you know, scared. I have problem. Yeah, we've <laughs> all done quite, that. Quite <laughs> invariably, I find someone who is an athlete 
I recall yeah. one kid who he was uh, exercising five, six hours uh, a, day, a day in a rowing team. He was really a muscular guy and he had a baseline AV block. It was a junctional rhythm at baseline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I asked him to jump and give me, you know, 50 push-ups, which he did, and then conduction was restored. And he, uh, and we looked at the ECG, it was indeed P wave, <laughs> you know, of course, very different. I, I, I had one guy come to see me who had a resting heart rate of 26. <laughs> yeah, this guy had a 32. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Excellent. Right, uh, next question. Um, are there any differences in failing hearts uh, in the functional uh, uh, inferior versus sinus, uh, superior sinus node? So I guess you've sort of answered that to some extent. Yeah, um, yeah. but again, again, we need to do more work, of course. It's need to do more, a yeah. Question, yeah. I think the pharmacological differences between the two nodes with failure is a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. So Maria Villa Abril uh, says, very nice talk in failing heart, which mechanism induced the change or disappeared in the population of automatic sinus nodal cells. Why disappeared one population and sinus nodal cells? Yeah, I don't know. But again, my <laughs> speculation would be because it's a severe heart failure, ventricles are actually quite uh, hypertrophied. And this, these rats all die by age yeah. of 18 weeks approximately. It's, it's really yeah. severe heart failure. So mechanical uh, profile in the atria probably is altered as I already speculated that extracellular matrix, you know, different set of pressures will probably alter, a, alter those cells. Yeah, very interesting idea. Thomas Brand, uh, two questions. First, TBX18 is required for the sinus node tail, so it would be perfect for determining the inferior sinus node. Any comments about uh, use of TBX18 as a marker for the tail? And then secondly, increased sensitivity of ACH in the superior node suggest some difference in intracellular signaling. So uh, I guess one of the mechanisms uh, for ACH or the differential ACH mm -hmm. effect. Uh, well, with, yes, TBX18 is an interesting thought indeed. Uh, and uh, we tried, uh, you know, to stain for it, but unfortunately antibodies didn't work in our hands uh, for TBX18. <laughs> uh, as far as ACH is concerned, yes, we do see actually differences in stress signaling and metabolic signaling between the two, two nodes. And I recall that uh, ACH uh, signaling is, is actually controlled during development, among other things, by uh, uh, PYK2, proline-rich tyrosine kinase. We, we had a paper several years back showing that when you knock it out, you, you dramatically change ACH signaling throughout the heart. And there was also another paper by a Japanese group about vascular, uh, vascular ACH control. Also, PYK2 uh, essentially controls that. And this would be a good thing to investigate in the future. Yeah. Uh, Igor, we're, we're, as fast as we're answering questions, more people are putting more questions in. Are you good <laughs> to continue for a little while? We still have uh, over 100 people uh, listening to you. So if you're... Uh, well, I have a meeting, but uh, with my students, I think they're also participants. So I hope they forgive me. We'll <laughs> just, move a little just bit Just tell them to wait. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep going. And see, uh, can Igor's students please contact others who are not in the meeting and tell them he's going to be delayed? <laughs> yeah. Tell them to log in. It's too late to win a $50 token, though. Um, David Wilson. Uh, have I missed one out here? Uh, oh, yes. No, wait, wait, tell Karen me. George is one of your students, I suspect. Yes. Fine. So, <laughs> so she has just said that she will email them and tell them to wait. Okay, good. Because she, organi <laughs> she organized this meeting. <laughs> Great. Uh, so Delphine comes in with another question. Would you observe the same localization for superior and inferior sinus node when using propranolol or atropine instead of ISO and ACH? I, I think coming back to the innovation question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, and also we need to look actually at some other regions as well. Yeah. And by the way, um, we also have some data not yet published uh, done with uh, uh, the group from UCLA with Dr. Shiv Kumar looking at innervation of uh, RVOT already in the ventricular realm. And we also found ha quite heavy innervation of both sympathetic and parasympathetic system. And this could explain why RVOT itself is a well-known pathological pacemaker. 50% of PVCs appear to originate from RVOT region, which probably shares the same paradigm. Uh, David Wolfson's just asked a very simple, similar question about differential innovation, so I think we'll, we'll skip over that one. Sanjay Karsha says, hi, Igor. Uh, did you hi, see Sanjay. any para parameter gradients, gap junctions, or iron channel conductances within the two sinus nodal regions? Thanks. 
Well, uh, we only have what we have, which I showed, and it is RNA-seq data. And yes, indeed, there is a gradient. Uh, we just uh, need to do more in terms of electrophysiological characterization. Danuta uh, Shejnezhna Kordari says, have you looked at uh, inferior and superior sinus node in the heart of hypertrophic cardiomyopathic patients? Can you predict that sudden cardiac death syndrome? Uh, have you ever seen the inferior and superior in the heart of sudden cardiac death victims? Uh, uh, is this pacemaker playing a role mm -hmm. in sudden cardiac death, I guess is the question. So, so actually these experiments are feasible. We can do it. We, mm. Currently we only accept hearts from uh, healthy donors. But again, healthy to to extend that heart is not acceptable for transplantation. <laughs> there is still yeah. something, something is wrong. But there is no cardiac pathology. However, we could potentially accept hearts also of people who actually died from sudden cardiac death. The problem is if there is a significant downtime uh, when heart is not perfused, it's really difficult to restore it uh, and uh, reperfuse it. And of course, we also could do work with, of course, uh, transplant patients who have uh, failing hearts and looking at that as well. But uh, it, it should be done in the future. We haven't done it yet. But, but I guess, Igor, I mean, transcriptional profiles may actually be able to be compared, um, even yeah, if you don't yeah. have any functional yeah. data. Mm -hmm. so that might be and actually, we are already looking at it uh, uh, as we speak. Uh, Fadi Akar uh, says, are the two pacemaker loci subject to com comparable source and sync relations in terms of their connection to the overlying atrial myocardium? And that could this be partly related to different rates that they generate? So are we talking yeah. about this? Right, right. Yeah, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, hi, Fadi. So uh, we, we published, and Mark Boyet published and a number of other groups showing that superior sinus node indeed is uh, it's on the border of fibrotic patch of tissue in the septum, which uncouples sinus node, superior sinus node from the septum, making it essentially to restore source sync uh, matching. In the inferior node, I don't know yet. We haven't looked at it. We really need to do uh, basically tissue level histology first to identify how fibrotic tissue is uh, uh, located there. But it could be a, a viable hypothesis. We should look at it. So it could play a role. But I don't think it's a major mechanism because we do see differences in expression of principal markers which uh, contribute to both voltage and calcium clocks, which could already explain differences in heart rate. Mm -hmm. So Maria Via uh, Abrila says the two sinus nodal subpopulations, are they functionally independent? Well, so of course, uh, there is always one leading. Uh, if uh, one leading pacemaker, it will suppress the other one. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you can only see inferior sinus node when superior is suppressed somehow, for example, by vagal stimulation, most naturally. We always assume, Igor, that when, uh, when the superior vena cave, uh, super, superior sinus node, the one we normally think about, is suppressed by a vagal stimulation that the AV node takes over. But you're telling us that mm -hmm. uh, more often the not perhaps this, the inferior node will take over in that situation. We do see in some cases it does jump to AV node as well. However, yeah. as, I, as I already said, uh, this is different structure. It's anatomically quite at some distance. So it's near orifice of inferior vena cava. And of course, we know where AV node is. And we've published previously a uh, number of studies in human and rabbit and many other species showing how AV node works as a pacemaker. Uh, Rudo Fischmeister is asking you a very difficult question. Uh, great talk, great data. I have a question on what is the reason for the differential effects of ISO and ACH on the inferior and superior nodes? Differential expression of muscarinic or beta receptors, cyclases, GS proteins, PDEs, right, etc. Right. So he wants to know all the details of the signaling pathways. Right. Well, <laughs> again, I mean, and I apologize. Uh, the, his next question said paper is not out yet. I think uh, Jacqueline already uploaded it yesterday. So hopefully it will be out uh, Soon. tomorrow. <laughs> Just wait for <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Basically, my answer would be the following. We do see some differences, as I showed, in um, uh, adrenergic receptor, uh, some, some essentially proteins involved in adre adrenergic signaling. I do not recall uh, G-protein specifically, uh, but uh, we can look at it. With, of course, And again, data is published. Anyone can look at it. It's available. And uh, um, we did not look more carefully in terms of uh, downstream signaling from G-protein coupled receptors, but I do suspect there should be differences as well. And we do see also differences in uh, metabolic uh, signaling. So me metabolism is also different between these two nodes. 
which would have an impact, of course, on, on all the other signaling as well. Mm -hmm. Igor, I'm pretty uh, sure that uh, Rodolfo and uh, Delphine Mika are on it now. They're probably isolating yeah. cells as we speak. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. the the <laughs> <laughs> so Louis Ganano uh, follows on from Davos' comment. There is a paper showing that RYR2 stabilizer VK changes the site where the atria starts depolarization. With your data, it will be possible to explain this much better. Ah, so, thank you. I think you're yeah, going we to do see some R R R R RYR2 differences as well, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to explain a lot of things with this idea. Alicia Mattiazzi, uh, did you explore whether there are any differences between the superior and inferior vena, uh, sinus nodes uh, that appear in heart failure? I think we talked about that a little bit. What, what we do see is both, I mean, there's only one, one of them functioning in heart failure, and it seems that regardless which one it is, they are capable of supporting the entire range of, of heart rates, depending on concentration of ACH or ICER. Uh, there's slight narrowing of, of range, but not statistically significant versus control. So okay. heart, heart, failing heart seems to not to go all the way up as healthy hearts to 500 uh, beats per minute, you know, but they do go to slower rates. So there is a and limit on it. Touched on this yeah. as well. An anonymous attendee has come in and said, what happened to people who had six sinus syndrome? Would two pacemaker activities, are the, would they be the same, I guess? Well, our, our luck was unfortunately not there. We, we tried to get a six sinus syndrome model. Actually, if anyone can suggest to me good model of six sinus syndrome, <laughs> I would really appreciate that. <laughs> it didn't work in my hands. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sharon George says, will do, whatever that means. Sanjay Kasha says, hi, Igor. Is there a paranodal area in all hearts you studied? Well, I mean, there is a gradient. I don't know if you wanna, would call it paranodal area, I guess. You can call it paranodal area, but we published a couple of papers, Sanjay, on this paranodal area already. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, we have happily uh, freed you up to go and talk to your students because we have got Excellent. to the end of... 34 different qu questions that you've uh, valiantly worked your way through. So, Igor, thank you. I think I really we, we have, I certainly have a million more questions. I'm sure most of the audience do. That was a spectacularly good and uh, a very provocative uh, uh, presentation. I think we're all going to go away and uh, change the way we do our research now because this is very exciting. So, well, uh, excellent, Igor, thank you. Please, if anyone has any more questions, I just send my email. It's just my last name at gwu.edu. Please send me email. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And please also make suggestions how to get, you know, six sign syndrome model. <laughs> and I really appreciate uh, Dower and, and Michael for organizing this fantastic symposium. Igor, really great, great opportunity. We couldn't get near to doing it without having wonderful speakers. And uh, you've uh, just epitomized that. So. Thank you, Igor, for an absolutely spectacular and, uh, and really uh, game-changing uh, webinar. So thank you, Igor. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, by the way, the questions are still coming in. We've just well, had two more questions. I don't know if you want to address them or not. It's up to oh, you. Oh, no, we have, yeah. Um, <laughs> but Sanjay and Vladimir have both sent in questions at the end. So Sanjay has said, that I appreciate the idea of the extracellular matrix providing mechanical support to the sinus node. Uh, but if there is non-conducting tissue, how does the electrical signal get out? <laughs> well, it's, it's not entirely non-conducting. It's basically no. a net, network of conducting cells immersed, you know, embedded into extracellular matrix. So it still can get, get out. But it's yeah. mechanically more robust as compared to uh, working myocardium. And Vladimir Golovko says, can the sinus nodes uh, work alternately? Have you ever yes. seen one node, then the next, like that? Actually, yes. Uh, during transition, when we change, for example, from uh, uh, isoproteranol to uh, acetylcholine, and during this transition, uh, there is sometimes alternating behavior. We see it in human and we see it in, in rat. It, it, it happens during, during this uh, instability. And sometimes even you see kind of a tachybrady syndrome when one goes slow, then the other one goes faster, and then they play and then essentially shift the site until it comes to steady state. Very, very, very interesting. Igor, thank you again for a wonderful webinar. Uh, and thank you to the audience for uh, tuning in and listening again. And uh, thank you, everybody out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.